Many ancient cultures shared similar beliefs in a sacred place in the north, often described as a harmonious paradise. The Norse would call it Agartha. For Hindus, it's referred to as Paradisha. The Greeks knew it as Hyperborea. The Celtics called it Avalon. Buddhists call it Shambhala. And in the Bible, it's referred to as the Garden of Eden. That's just a few of the names. In fact, this place has been dubbed the Land of a Thousand Names. At the center of this paradise is the Axis Mundi, also called the Cosmic Axis, World Axis, World Pillar, Center of the World, and World Tree. This is said to be the connection between heaven and earth. Here is the Norse depiction. We have Yggdrasil, which is the tree of life. This is Mount Meru, from Buddhist, Jain, and Hindu cosmology. It's a central world mountain that reaches high into the heavens, and resting above it is the North Star. In the Mayan cosmology, there is a central pyramid. Same theme with the Inca cosmology and the Navajo cosmology. So you get the idea, and of course this is fascinating on its own, but here's where it gets crazy. In the 15 and 1600s, many maps were made that depicted four large islands in the Arctic region surrounding the North Pole. The most popular map with these Arctic landmasses comes from 1595 by Gerardus Mercator, where we can see a large black mountain called the Rupus Nigra, surrounded by a great whirlpool into which four powerful rivers flow. These rivers divide a massive landmass into four distinct islands. These islands were said to have been written about in great detail in a lost book from the 14th century called the Invincio Fortunata, which itself also references much older and similarly lost work. Suddenly, in the mid-1600s, all traces of the four Arctic lands, the Central Mountain, and the Whirlpool had vanished, not to be seen on any map thereafter. Currently, we are told that there is no land at the North Pole, but instead, a floating ice sheet that expands and contracts from season to season. Here's a short clip from a documentary claiming to be going to the North Pole. Arriving destination, 15, 6, 12, 10, 2. North Pole, top of the world, guys. Top of the world. We'll get that in a minute, Jake. How cool is that? So what do you think? Is the real North Pole being hidden from us? Are they hiding land at the center of the Earth? Is that why we are told about Santa Claus at an early age and it's conveniently related to the North Pole so that when we inevitably find out that Santa Claus is total BS, we also dismiss the North Pole? Not that it doesn't exist, but you know, we just kind of forget about it along with Santa Claus. Sure feels that way. And as usual, the truth seems to show up in plain sight in Hollywood movies. I just watched the new movie The Dark Tower, based on the Dark Tower book series by Stephen King, and sure enough, it was all about the Axis Mundi. You draw with a good hand. I just don't know what this is. It's a map. My father showed me a... A map like this once. Inside the circle is your world and my world. Many others. No one knows how many. The Dark Tower stands at the center of all things. And it stood there from the beginning of time. Dark Tower equals Rupus Nigra, or the Black Rock. And in the movie, a young boy goes to another dimension called Midworld, and the only reason he's able to get in is because, quote, His shine is pure. That's a prerequisite in a lot of the North Pole Paradise mythology we were discussing earlier. 
This magical kingdom will only reveal itself to believers pure in heart. What does this mean? It means that you must shed all your past traditional beliefs and open your mind and heart to the possibilities of the invisible worlds beyond our senses of reality. The Western world has been conditioned to see first, then believe. But in the search for Shambhala, you must believe first. Just like in the movie Doctor Strange. You're talking to me about healing through belief. I reject it because I do not believe in fairy tales about chakras or energy or the power of belief. There is no such thing as spirit. We are made of matter and nothing more. You're just another tiny momentary speck within an indifferent universe. You think too little of yourself. In the Wonder Woman movie, the guys are on the ocean, it's dark and foggy, then suddenly they poke through to see a beautiful hidden land. On Kong, Skull Island, there is a hidden land surrounded by a perpetual storm system. When the people finally get there by way of helicopter, you can see the Aurora Borealis. So there we have a hidden land in the Arctic connection. On the movie The BFG, Big Friendly Giant, there's a scene where they jump through a water gateway to a hidden land. And again, we see the Aurora Borealis in the scene. On the video game Uncharted 2, we get this cutscene. Entrance to Shambhala must be right here. Here it is, Elena. The secret entrance to Shambhala. In the movie The Golden Compass, there is a magical dust at the North Pole that connects the world to a parallel universe. That movie, The Fountain, was a weird one. Have you ever seen that? Had some domed world tree of life symbolism. Here's one that I didn't catch until recently, but during the credits, the end credits of the first Thor movie, it has the mountain reaching the heavens, depicted in the Yggdrasil, Norse Tree of Life cosmology. Of course, that one is easy. Thor is obviously full of Norse concepts. My favorite part is when they are fighting on the Bifrost Bridge, aka Rainbow Road. If you don't get the joke, then you need to play some Mario Kart. Now this next movie is by far my favorite on this list. It's called The Children Who Chased Lost Voices. 
known as Journey to Agartha in the UK. It is said to be a place where any kind of wish can be fulfilled, even resurrecting the dead. <sighs> is Agartha a real place? Who knows? It could just be an old legend. It's very straightforward, where a little girl journeys to Agartha, and I highly recommend this one. The story and the animation are just perfect. Visually stunning masterpiece for sure. So I'm going to get out of here, hope you enjoyed this video, and I have to say that I barely scratched the surface on this. A channel called Flat Earth Paradise covers this topic in great detail and inspired me to make my own video. I'll have a link for his channel in the description. Thanks for watching. And from there, I went to the middle of the earth and saw a blessed, well-watered place which had branches which remained alive and sprouted from a tree which had been cut down. And there I saw a holy mountain, and under the mountain, to the east of it, there was water, and it flowed towards the south. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it was parted and became four heads. Beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion, in the far north, the city of the great king. What's exciting about this? Well, they're all facing north, right? Yeah, so? The needle's naturally drawn to the Earth's magnetic north pole. Meaning, if we follow the compasses north, they should lead us to the gate. Pluto is said to have been discovered in 1930. From 1930 to 2006, we have been taught that there are nine planets in our so-called solar system. In 2006, Pluto was stripped of its planetary status, meaning since 2006, the International Astronomical Union officially recognizes eight planets. Well, what if I told you that there are only seven planets, including the moon and the sun, and not including Earth? What if I told you that this deception has been hidden right under our noses all along? Let's have a look at our calendar week. Sunday equals, you guessed it, Sunday. Monday equals Moon Day. Tuesday equals Mars Day. Wednesday equals Mercury Day. Thursday equals Jupiter Day, Friday equals Venus Day, Saturday equals Saturn Day. These are the original seven planets encoded in our weekdays. Let's have a look at the etymology of planet. It tells you how basically the planets are wandering stars, and if you look down here on the bottom it says, so called because they have apparent motion, unlike the fixed stars, originally included also the moon and sun. The ancient Greeks considered the planets to be wandering stars. 
Their chart has Earth, which wasn't considered a planet, in the center, with the seven planets circuiting around it in the following order. Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and then Saturn in the outermost ring. If you look one ring past Saturn, you'll see the firmament, also known as the crystalline heaven, which contains all the stars. Here's an Egyptian system with the same seven planets going around Earth. In Aleister Crowley's book, 777, he repeatedly wrote about the seven planets, including the sun and moon, constantly connecting them with seven alchemical metals and seven days of the week. If you look at the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Creation, which is the oldest known Kabbalistic text, it has tons of references to seven. Kind of like the Bible, some parts of the Bible anyway. Seven archangels, seven seals, and if you look at chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Seven planets in the universe, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon. Seven days in the year, the seven days of the week, seven gates in the souls, male and female, two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, and a mouth. In chapter 4, verse 15, it says, Seven universes, seven lands, seven seas, seven rivers, seven deserts, seven days, seven weeks, seven years, seven sabbaticals, seven jubilees, and the holy palace. Therefore he made sevens beloved under all the heavens. Chapter 4 in this book is mostly about the number seven. And in this particular version of the Sefer Yetzirah that I'll be linking in the description, on page 187, it goes on explaining the seven firmaments, the seven earths, meaning seven continents, and so on. I found that interesting. 33rd degree Freemason Manly P. Hall wrote quite a bit about the seven planets in his most famous book entitled The Secret Teachings of All Ages. I'll read you a couple things. The seven wonders of the world, while apparently designed for diverse reasons, were actually monuments erected to perpetuate the arcana of the mysteries. They were symbolic structures placed in peculiar spots, and the real purpose of their erection can be sensed only by the initiated. Alifa Slevi has noted the marked correspondence between these seven wonders and the seven planets. The seven wonders of the world were built by widows' sons in honor of the seven planetary genii. Their secret symbolism is identical with that of the seven seals of Revelation and the seven churches of Asia. Pythagoras, according to some authorities, divided the universe into nine parts, according to others, into twelve parts. The twelvefold system was as follows. The first division was called the Empyrean or the sphere of the fixed stars, and was the dwelling place of the immortals. The second to twelfth divisions were, in order, the spheres of Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, and the Moon, and fire, air, water, and earth. This arrangement of the seven planets, the Sun and Moon being regarded as planets in the old astronomy, is identical with the candlestick symbolism of the Jews. The sun in the center as the main stem, with three planets on either side of it. And that's just a couple of examples about the seven planets in Manly P. Hall's The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Another aspect of this seven planets idea for me was looking at a couple articles about how Uranus isn't a planet and about how Neptune shouldn't be considered if Pluto isn't. This gives a bit more credence to my line of thinking, but I'll admit that this is all just personal speculation on the subject. Since I've been able to see the flat earth as the truth, I've also come to understand that earth was never meant to be considered a planet. In fact, it's a planate, which means plane or flat surface. Earth wasn't considered a planet until the 16th or 17th century, so it's all fairly new. Whether Uranus, Neptune, or even Pluto are actually planets or not doesn't really matter. The thing is that Earth is not a planet, 
We don't live on a wandering star. We live on Earth, which is nothing more than land, because the water is not included in the word Earth. What we witness above us in the night skies are the planets, the wandering stars, the luminaries, moving about while the stars move uniformly in circuits, contrary to the wandering stars. When this information presented itself to me, I felt compelled to touch on the subject. So, thanks for watching. Until next time. The stars will not fall. Oh, really? No, because they're fixed to the lid of the chest. The lid will open in two halves and then Jesus will appear. What chest are you talking about? Don't you know that the universe is a gigantic chest? Heaven is the lid on top and the earth the ground below. <laughs> they haven't told this fool that the earth is round. The earth is flat. Your head is flat. <laughs> Read the scriptures. If the earth is round, why don't the people at the bottom fall off? Huh? And what about the ones on the sides? Why don't they slide off? Think about that. <laughs> Davos knows. Hey, brother, what do you say? Is the earth flat or round? Only God knows those things.